So, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. So, I got a question for you, Nick. Seeing how you said we didn't have any questions up, I've got a question for you. What was King Nebuchadnezzar's middle name? Okay, so. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> good luck with that one. Good morning, church. We're glad you're your here with us today. Get out your Bible. <laughs> Get out. Uh, welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're watching online, we're having fun today. <laughs> Wish you were here with us. But do say hi so we know that you're here with us this morning. Uh, and uh, it is a wonderful day to be in God's presence today. Uh, we've had a very busy weekend so far. We had men's breakfast yesterday, and we had some newcomers to the breakfast yesterday, so it was neat to see some new faces. Uh, last night we had movie night, and that was excellent as well. Um, I don't know, but everything last night, the food just tasted a little bit better. I, I'm, I'm not sure what it was all about, but hey, it was a good time. Uh, movie was really good too, so we are coming up on, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, <laughs> got ahead of myself, and they're back there going, hey. Uh, join us Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for The Chosen as we continue our Bible study series on that. Uh, it is an awesome, awesome season. So a lot of things going on. And so we had uh, the preview, so to speak, of the Sermon on the Mount uh, this last week and, and some very neat revelations that came along with that. So join us Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. as we continue on through the season. And, uh, of course, our sermon series, then uh, Sundays at 10 a.m., which you're here for today. So here we go. Uh, and if you want to catch up on the series, you can uh, tune in on the Android or Apple apps or watch online. And all of the links are on our web page, as you see on the screen right now. Click on your favorite link of all time, and it'll take you in there so that you can see it. There's also a number of streaming services that carry the chosen as well. So you have a lot of different options to be able to see this awesome, awesome work. Uh, Orange Track Racing then continues next Saturday and uh, we're counting down the year. So we have one more month once this one gets under, we have the finals in November. And uh, there's numbers of people in here who have packed the box, so to speak. So we, what we do is, uh, each time they win their series of race that we're on, then that winning vehicle goes in and, and we put them in a box. And so then in November, we race all those cars against each other and it's really, really a great time. So try and stop on out. Um, hope to see you there. And that is starts, registration starts at 9.30, racing at 10 o'clock. And uh, if you need more information, orangetrackracing.org. Our next men's breakfast. Now, I got to tell you about breakfast yesterday. We had some new faces there, which was really fun. Um, but Russ Kegmine decided he was going to go all in, and he did. He made crepes, and then he stuffed those crepes with ham and Swiss cheese, and then he covered the entire dish with hollandaise sauce. So you know. Didn't bring me any leftovers. <laughs> I was I was yeah. a bad husband, so you know, what can I say? Well, were there any leftovers? See, that's the question. There weren't any. You couldn't. He took the dish right away. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah, he was out of here. Snapped that dish up, and he was gone. Uh, but we had biscuits and gravy, and we had uh, excellent job by Doug on the grill yesterday on the griddle, and we had eggs and pancakes and sausage and oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't have to eat anything for a while yesterday, I'll say that much. But our next men's breakfast will be November 4th at 9 a.m. Same place as here, we, were, we just converted it all over. So we were too busy, very, very busy, converting this back and forth yesterday to get us where we are this morning. And then our next movie night is gonna be, you got it, November 4th. So we're gonna do breakfast in the morning and the movie at night, just like we did yesterday. And that will be showing the Chronicles and Ernie of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And this is last in the movie series. Um, however, if you get interested, there's seven books in the series. So we've covered three out of the seven books. And uh, so again, 
the doors open at 5.30, movie at 6 o'clock or thereabouts, depending upon what kind of disaster we had. Uh, <laughs> we had some challenges, I'll say that. And we were sweating bullets, weren't we? <laughs> Doug and I were over there trying to figure out how are we going to get sound when our sound interface, our little interface device, decided to be die, die on us and we had, so our, it was a scramble. But God is good and we got, we got up and running in time for the movie and, and had a good movie then. So as we begin our worship today, uh, for those of you that are at home, Terry has put up the playlist of our music for today, so make sure you check that out to get the, the message and music along this, uh, with what we are giving here today in person. So let's go to our call to worship this morning and let's enter into a word of prayer. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come before you today with all praise, honor, and glory for you today, Lord. And we just ask that you would open our hearts to receive the message that you uh, have planned for us, that you have given Pastor Terry to give to us today, and also the message and music as well. Lord, open our, our eyes to see the wonders of your world and our ears to hear and to be filled with your blessings each and every day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather here freely and openly to hear your word today. And we just ask that you would help us to receive it into our hearts and to live it out in our lives each and every day. In your precious and holy name I pray today. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship that Terry has picked out for us is 1 John 3, 1 and 2. And this comes from the New Living Translation. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us all that we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. This is an awesome, awesome passage because it gives us a lot of different uh, perspectives and we, we talked about perspectives yesterday for our devotion for the men's breakfast and our perspectives of how we see things is based upon our experiences and that perspective then drives our thoughts and actions along the way so as we become children of God and become uh, children of Christ and we have God within us and the Holy Spirit is speaking to us our perspective changes and we start to see things from God's perspective. And that was our message yesterday morning. And it's really cool because uh, Terry and I didn't talk about this, but this is exactly what this passage is all about. This passage speaks to us as the church, as God's community. And we as children of God are characterized by the love for one another. And we have a lot of love for one another within this church. We care if one of us is not able to be here. We care about them if they're sick or if they're hurt. And we lift them up in prayer. And that's what being a community of God, a community in Christ is all about. Then we wait for a final realization of what that shall be, what that's going to look like in the end. And that's what this verse is talking about in here. The, that, what, that, what that's going to look like for us. How we are going to see Christ finally in reality of who he is in all of his glory and splendor. And we get to be there for it as children of Christ in God's community. And that is speaking to us of Jesus Christ in his final coming. And if you look around the world today and we see all the signs that it speaks of in Revelation and other books as well, uh, I think we're getting close, you know. No one knows the day or time, so we always have to be ready. So in your heart, make sure that you accept Christ into your heart and that you're ready when that trumpet sounds. But in Jesus, uh, when Jesus appears in his final coming, the word says his followers will be like him. And we want to understand right now that we are never going to be exactly like he is or the same as Christ. But it will be enough to be like him in order to be called to be with him. So I want you to kind of hang on to that, that thought process in there. And then it says then we will have a re revelation fellowship. And I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. This is a revelation fellowship, which means all things will be revealed to us that have been hidden as mysteries, as children of Christ, as children of God. 
We belong to the same family then. As those children of God, we belong to the same family. May have different last names right now, but guess what? We are all children of God. We are all part of God's family through God. So we're going to have this revelation fellowship. And then God has not yet revealed what we will become when that time comes. We do that, know that when Christ appears, we shall be with him and we shall know his true nature which I think is awesome because his word tells us this and promises. And we will become like him, thus renewing then in us the image of God. And I talked about that on Wednesday night a little bit, uh, about that image of God and how we are being transformed to be like Christ. And this is what this whole verse in 1 John talks about. So if we think about it, that's a really, really a, a secure and comforting revelation that we have coming to us. God is going to reveal all these things that we are going to become like him. And then there's the last things, which is purity. And it talks about the last things in there, and that purity is the prospect of seeing Christ at its return is a purifying hope. It gives us that hope that will allow us to purify, to become like him. And I talked about that in my message last week about we are being perfected as we grow in Christ. God is revealing more of his nature to us, more of his secrets and mysteries to us as we grow in our relationship with God. And this is part of it, and this is that purifying hope. And to be able to see him and become like him then at last, that purification process. Since he is pure, purity is required to be like Jesus. Therefore, the goal for believers is to become increasingly Christ-like in our actions, in our interactions with each other and with other people, and in our behaviors. And this is not an easy task because this is going to take work on our parts. It's not just going to be, you know, wave that wand and boof, you know, we're transformed. It takes work on our part to do these things and to be these things. And in order to do that, then, in the end, we will really receive the revelation of God's Spirit upon us and purity in Christ Jesus. And that's that purifying hope I was talking about. So we got a lot to look forward to. Even though the world may be going to, dare I say, hell in a handbasket, to pardon that old phrase, but simply put, you see a lot of that going on in the world today. There's a lot of satanic behavior. There's a lot of uh, spiritual behavior that does not belong to God. And for those who tag along with it and are easily influenced to go along with the flow, well, see, that drags you away from God. It separates you from God. And so there's warfare going on, and it's subtle at times. It's subtle at times. There are people out there that want to drag you down and keep you away from that spirit of God being and living within you. So as we get these mysteries, as our relationship with God comes closer and gets stronger, that should help us stay away from those influences of the world that would take us to hell instead of to heaven. Make sense? Cool. It's Terry's turn, so let us pray. Gracious Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to hear this message that you've given Pastor Terry to share with us today. Lord, we ask that you would uh, keep us concentrated on you and not on any other distractions today, but just simply concentrated on you and your word and the message that you want to put upon our hearts today so that we can live you out throughout the week and away from the distractions of the world. We thank you in all these things. We pray a special blessing on Pastor Terry as he gives the message today. And in Jesus' name we all pray and said, Amen. Amen. Yeah, so Mark's talking about distractions, and I'm standing over off to the side looking at a few bags of leftover popcorn and cookies. And for those of you that like them, there's some Ziploc bags that looks like little tiny tomatoes. So just all kinds of treats over the side. Distraction, squirrel. 
Well, Mark talked about distractions too, and the distractions of the world, and I was immediately transported back to the early 2000s out of Promise Keepers where I heard the Christian comedian Brad Stein say, put a helmet on. <laughs> Recently I heard a uh, conversation uh, between two separate sides of, a, of an issue, and the speaker was Candace Owens. Candace is actually pregnant right now. <laughs> the person called something out and basically was uh, upset about their feelings being hurt, and she, she looked right at him and said, put a helmet on, and I thought, oh, she likes Brad Stein too. Yeah, <laughs> but we do, all the time, we do hard things. If you're like me and you're listening to somebody, so this is perfect with what Mark was saying, my mind, I, I, knew the scripture that he was going to use. Uh, I kind of, knowing Mark as well as I do, I kind of knew the direction he was going to go with it, and my mind drifted off to Brad Stein. So we, we're drifting off, and when we're hearing things, we're going off and going to things where we remember situations or places that we've been that that makes sense to us. And that's part of what the episode this week was about. We, got, we have flashbacks that just remind us of things. I see a kid riding on a bike, and I flash back to when I was seven, and I was riding down the gravel hill, coming down to our uh, lane, quarter mile lane that led up to the house, and I hit a rut in the lane with my front tire, you know, bars up like, what was those, the sissy bars, I call those, and the banana seat on the bike. I, well, there was quite a lot of room for a seven-year-old to go right on through the handlebars, and I, I don't baseball, I wasn't good at sliding, you know, the normal way. I actually did a headlong slide, and it was the only time I ever managed one of those. It was all by accident, but that's where my mind goes when I see something like that. It just, you get transported based on what you see. That's what we do at the beginning of each episode. We're transported to a different time. In this case, we were transported back to when Matthew and Alpheus, his father, are talking. And it's a, it's a scene that I immediately am transported to Luke 15 and reminded of the parable of the lost son. A little bit different context. In, in the teaching of the parable of the lost son, the son asks for his inheritance and thereby says to his father, without saying it in the words, he says, you're dead to me. Give me what's mine once you're dead, so you're dead to me, and I'm going to go off and do my own thing. Well, it's a similar fashion this week. However, it's a different family member renouncing another family member. And in this case, Matthew's father, Alpheus, renounces him because he has become a tax collector for the Romans. I can't imagine this was easy for Alphaeus and his wife to just say, you're dead to us, we don't want anything more to do with you, go away. And it wasn't a disowning of him. I mean, we hear people, I, I disown him, you know, I disown that son, I disown that daughter, I just don't want anything to do with him anymore. He was declaring Matthew was dead to them. Now, let's fast forward, because that's what they did in the episode. They immediately fast forward to the big event. Now, as we ended season two in that episode, we left Jesus as he was walking up with the back side of that stage. I'm thinking rock concerts that we've been to and, and all these things, walking up and the curtains opening up. And, you know, when you go to rock concert, there's all kinds of lights and, and smoke and all this other stuff. So I'm th Jesus coming out on the stage as a rock star, right? Well, it's fair to assume there was no stage when this actually went down. In fact, it was much more likely that it was what we saw in this most recent episode. Jesus standing amongst the people. And in, this, in the episode, we can see the stage kind of off in the background, but kind of like it doesn't exist. Well, the messages that are contained in what he is saying to the people in this, in this Sermon on the Mount 
these are, this is all together one. But these are the same messages that will be spoken in different ways throughout the course of his ministry. This sermon, Jesus, he delivers a hard-hitting, counter-cultural message as thousands of people gathered and are impacted by it. And I'm thinking of all the people that would be offended by it. And all I can think of is put a helmet on. You're getting upset about something that you don't need to be upset about. Just ignore it if you don't want it. But we had such a huge lead up to this. How many of you who had not seen past the last episode of season two thought that the first few episodes were going to be all about the Sermon on the Mount? That we were going to get the full teaching of the Sermon on the Mount? Well, I got a spoiler alert. <laughs> we don't. You can kind of see. Jesus standing amongst all the people and they're intently listening and you know, you've got the sage kind of in the background there. And as he preaches, as he's giving this message, we're getting little bits and pieces of it. And he is uh, teaching and the people around, we start seeing flashbacks. They start flashing back to different parts of their lives that they remember of what's going on. Now, we don't see the flashback for, per se for Matthew, but for instance, he remembers the heartbreaking moment with his parents and is confronted by Jesus' message to forgive and show mercy. Now, because we're not going to go through the whole thing, we do want you to go out to GraceStreet.Church. We do want you to click on messages, and we do want you to listen to the Sermon on the Mount series that we had back in 2018. And I won't beat on that again. This is the last time I'm going to say it. But we want you to go back and we want you to listen to that. Because then you can hear the whole teaching. And you can hear uh, the breakdown of it. And it was, what, seven weeks? Six or seven weeks uh, sermon series. So <clears throat> there's no way I could fit all of that into this morning. Much as I would like to, it's impossible. So like Jesus, we're going to hit some highlights. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is recorded in Matthew 5 through 7. And this is his longest sermon that is recorded in the Bible. So let's go to Matthew 5, 1 and 2, the very beginning of it. This is at the beginning. This, and it says, one day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Now, the exact location, who's to say the exact location of it? I mean, you could say, oh, it was right here, and it could have been a quarter mile away, half mile away, mile away. It could have been anywhere along this side of the Sea of Galilee. But many believe it was on the Mount of Beatitudes, as it is now called, which is located on a hill overlooking the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. As I was researching this and looking at it, this is an area that has this most amazing view of the Sea of Galilee. I actually got to talk to a lady who was in Israel this past week, whose phone unfortunately wasn't working, other than to take the amazing pictures. She said the only reason the phone isn't in the Sea of Galilee is because it does take the amazing <laughs> pictures. But she said you would not believe the beauty of this area. And you know, Jesus being Jesus, he's going to pick an area that's going to have great acoustics. He's not going to need one of these things to get the message out. Now, when we uh, study the Sermon on the Mount, many theologians think, believe that it's a summary of the entirety of the New Covenant, which makes sense. And in very much the same way the law was given on Mount Sinai, Jesus gives summary of the new covenant on the Mount of Beatitudes. In this sermon, Jesus proclaims his attitude toward the law. The position, authority, money, none of them are important in his kingdom. And this isn't in here, I'm going to sidebar, so 
you guys in the back, I apologize. I was reading an, uh, a, just a short story this morning about a gentleman with the last name Goodyear. <clears throat> he left school at 12, married in his early 20s, and was fascinated with all things, and he was an inventor. And he would go broke, he would lose his business, he would go broke, and he would end up in debtor's prison in the early 1800s. While he's in prison, he continues his experimenting and creates vulcanization. He creates how a tire can be made, how you can use it so it doesn't wear out, so the rubber doesn't wear out. He would go on, and you would think, his name's Goodyear. We have tires named after him. We have, I think you can even go to the store now, I think at Walmart, they have Goodyear shoes. You buy all these things that are a product of what he did. But here's the thing. He never once profited from his invention. It would be 40 years after his death at 59 that someone would start a company called Goodyear in his honor. And that's where we have Goodyear today. It's not about all these things. What's your lasting impact? When we look at Jesus' lasting impact, we're 2,000 years beyond his death and resurrection, and look at the impact he continues to have. We talked about Wednesday night, Kat Von D, who is this famous tattoo artist who was into witchcraft. She recently was baptized. And when she came out of the baptismal, she had a, a full immersion baptism. After the, father, after the pastor said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, she came up and she hugged him. Her life has been transformed. So it's not about position, it's not about authority, and it's not about the money. It's a faithful obedience that comes from our heart. And Sermon on the Mount challenged the proud and legalistic religious leaders of the day. And we see this in the scriptures. We see this depicted in this series. It, it really calls them back to the messages of the Old Testament prophets. Who, like Jesus, teaches that heartfelt obedience is more important than legalistic observance. So many churches are wrapped up in... These are the rules, and if you don't follow the rules, you can't be baptized, you, you can't take communion, you can't do this, you can't do that. There used to be a time in one denomination that if you didn't have a coin, when you went up to take communion, if you forgot it at home, you didn't have one, you weren't given one, you hadn't earned one because you hadn't followed the rules, you couldn't take communion. What do we say? Be right with God in your heart. Heartfelt obedience. Come, eat, drink. This is a message that, and this word is overused, but it's just as relevant today as it was back then. In this sermon, Jesus clarifies many misinterpretations of the Old Testament meanings, and he says this, he would start by, you have heard, and he quotes the Old Testament piece, but then he says, but I say, but I say, he expounds on it, he gives it more meaning and more context. And Jesus will take these and he breaks them down in the Sermon on the Mount so that we have tangible things that we can do in our lives to live for him. Jesus starts this sermon with what has become known as the Beatitudes. So let's look at Matthew 5, 3 and 12. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. 
God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my follower. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. The Beatitudes can be in, uh, understood in four different ways. Number one, they are a code of conduct and standard of conduct for all of us as believers. They contrast kingdom values against worldly values. So think eternal values versus temporary values. They contrast the superficial faith of the religious leaders and the true faith that Jesus demands. And they show how the Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the new kingdom. So he's got a good summary of the story. And it, this is not a, a multiple choice where you can pick one or another. This is uh, like E, all the above. You have to choose all of them. Being blessed is the joy and happiness that we have regardless of what's happening to us and around us. And we've talked about uh, our daughter Amanda who is on dialysis and she recently got an infection around her port and she's been struggling to dialysize properly. And last Friday night, she had texted me Saturday morning, Friday night she was able to get through the whole night, but she only got 20% of what, off what she needed to have come off. So surgery is, is imminent for her. And then this Wednesday, she will meet with the transplant team. But through it all, she is understanding that she is the daughter of a king, a child of God, and that is where she is clinging to. Fortunately, she is blessed with an amazing husband who makes her text him. He works overnights. She has to text him every so often to let him know how it's going. Even if he doesn't respond, she has to text him. And then her daughter, who I'm not sure how this happened, but she's going to be 12 in January. She has stepped up and she is changing. She's unfortunately growing up a little too quickly, but she is becoming mommy's helper. So it's it's really about how we look at that. Additionally, after this, Jesus teaches on about being the light of the world. You know, you don't hide, you know, he talks about putting the light underneath the basket. We don't do that. If we have the cure for a disease, we're not going to hide it from the rest of the world. We need to share it. While we have the cure for eternity, we need to share it. He, he taught about the law and that he had come to accomplish its purpose. Accomplish its purpose, not to make it go away or disappear. It won't disappear until its purpose is achieved. And he, then he, uh, he taught that even our thoughts will be judged. And in this, he used anger as one, as one and adultery as another. So it's not just being angry. It's not just standing in front of somebody toe to toe and having an argument with them. It's even the thought of having that argument, even those things that run through our head. Or, or when it comes to adultery, it's not just about a physical act. It's about just the thought is considered adultery. He talks about divorce and vows and revenge and giving to the needy. And then there's the Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That one always hits people hard. What do you mean, pray for my enemy, love my enemies? He also talks about the importance of prayer and fasting. That it's a, a personal conversation with God and it's not about us. He talked about money and possessions and judgment. And he also taught about the golden rule. So let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Do to others what you would like them to do to you. 
This is the essence of all that is taught in the Law and the Prophets. This goes right along with loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Jesus also taught in 13 and 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. He would go on and he would teach us about the tree and its fruit. You see, a good tree produces good fruit. You can identify a good tree by that fruit. But if it doesn't produce good fruit, the tree is bad. You can judge a Christian in the same way. If the fruit of our buffet is good, well, you can take it from there. For, for some, one of the hardest parts is when Jesus teaches about being a true disciple. So let's jump to verse 21 where he says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of the Father in heaven will enter. I'm transported right to the bridesmaids. You had the five foolish bridesmaids that used up all their oil. And then they ran to buy some more. But by the time they got to the door and knocked, he told them to depart. He didn't know them. That's what he's talking about here. So again, see, these teachings are being taught in other places and in different ways. And Jesus finishes then talking about building a solid foundation. Unless that foundation is solid, it will not stay standing. We live in a split-level home. We had the steps, the concrete steps that led up. You did the little U-turn, and then you went in the house, right? Well, the cap ended up like this. So, like this. Because the foundation under it had crumbled. It was, what, six foot, I think, wide, if you're looking at the front of the house. Five foot of that had deteriorated and was missing this much. I had found some bricks that I put under it just to hold it up. The foundation was awful. It was not built well. We have to have a firm foundation or it will crumble. It actually crumbled. It looked like sand when it crumbled. So unless that foundation is solid, it won't stay standing. And really, and this was going to be the title of the sermon, there was something for everyone. In this sermon, there was something for absolutely everyone. Those that would choose to follow Jesus would have to learn to do hard things. I've got questions.org, and I like this website because it has some really good answers. Some of them I don't, you know, there's some theological differences out there, but I loved how they summarized the Sermon on the Mount. It says, how to live a life that is dedicated and pleasing to God free from hypocrisy, full of love and grace, full of wisdom and discernment. It's a great one-sentence summary of the sermon. Well, after finishing the sermon in this episode, we see Jesus taking a moment to rest and get a bite to eat. i got to imagine he was exhausted, because again, this is going to be over a course of days. People still had questions. People were still wanting to talk to him. Eventually, it was just Jesus, the disciples, and his immediate followers after everyone had filtered away. And Jesus obviously was wanting some time alone. He needed time to recharge, and he needed time to spend with God. So he sent them off back to Capernaum for a few days. Now, we have just been introduced to Judas Iscariot, and he decides to leave his current employ to follow Jesus. He's going to leave this mentor. He's so excited and full of wonder after listening to this sermon that he doesn't even flinch when his mentor threatens to sue him for breach of contract. Go ahead, basically was his answer. He didn't care. This is the one time I think that he didn't care about money. Following Jesus in that moment was more important. He was having what we tend to call a mountaintop experience. Now, we will see Judas go and see his sister, which this isn't in the scriptures at all. But he, had, he told her everything he had heard. 
and then he hands her the deed to his home and gives her all his worldly possessions and her fears that she will never see him again. A little foreshadowing there is happening as to the events that will play out later. But she does say this. It's always about money with you, Judas. So she's not understanding what he is going to be doing and how he can leave. We're also introduced to Joanna, a woman who works in the palace of King Herod in Machaerus. She has gotten to know and has spoken with John the Baptist, and he sent her to hear Jesus' message. He said, it's time for you to hear the, his message. And she's so taken with his teaching that she has this extremely expensive piece of cloth that she gives to the women that are following Jesus. And at first, they don't want to take it because they're questioning her motives. She finally convinces them to take it. But then Andrew convinces her to let him tag along back so he can see John. And he has his own discussion with John. And he, he, John reiterates what Andrew has heard from Jesus and gets Andrew set on the right path so that he can follow and be a disciple. There are multiple other plot lines that emerge at this point. We see Thomas and Rama flirting and making plans to see each other. Shall I come after the third meal? And then he goes, how about after the second meal? And at the very end, before they part ways, she goes, how about after the first? Setting up something that, I'm not going to give away what's going to happen next, but we also see Simon Peter and Eden getting home and they finally have a moment of time together. And they embrace only to have and you can obviously see Peter's annoyed and Eden's not. And after they start to get that situated you hear and they're uninvited guest. Even talk about centering them to sleep up on the roof. But let's go back to Matthew. Matthew is still kind of uh, an outsider, even within the little group. He's the bad duck, for lack of a better term. He has no place to go. Why? Because one, his parents have declared him dead to them, and two, he gave them his home. He doesn't even have that to go back to. So he camps out overnight. But before that, he goes and he's, as Mary comes out of her home, she sees him standing across the, the passageway there. And he just looks like a lost puppy. He, has, he doesn't know what to do. Both Mary and Rama will eventually provide him the assurance he needs that he is doing well. He needed that assurance. Because during the sermon, he was so profoundly affected by what Jesus said that he knew he had to go, regardless of any arguments or disagreements they might have had, that he needed to go and reconcile with his parents. see them. Talk about doing hard things. Just as about, he, he's up to the door, he's about ready to knock, and who do we see? His puppy. Barking and jumping on him and making a ruckus. And that draws his father out. Because the next thing we see is Alpheus open the door. You can tell by the look on Matthew's face that he is ready for the worst. Can you imagine the shock when he's greeted by his father and Alphaeus says, Son. I don't know about y'all, those of you that have seen the episode, it caused me to tear up. It's actually affecting me right now when I think about him saying, Son. 
has forgiven us just as often as forgave Matthew. God forgives us when we turn from our sinful ways and ask him into our lives and ask for the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. And that's exactly what is happening in this scene. Transports us, transport me right back to the call to worship from this morning, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. See how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. Verse 1 simply tells us we are children of God. Verse 2 tells us who we are becoming. Reflections of God. I'm reminded of Paul talking about looking into the mirror and not see, you're seeing that clouded version, and we won't see who we really are until we are in front of Christ, our God. The Christian life is a process that continues, well, it continues until our time here on earth is done. Though this, through this process, we will become more and more like Jesus. And that's the crux of this passage. Back in, in 2010, uh, we were at youth group and I had come across a book and I suggested this to all the kids to go and buy and read because it was about uh, two brothers, Brett and Alex Harris, wrote a book called Do Hard Things. And they wrote a follow-up book in 2016. They continued to go out and talk and do uh, talks to groups talking about what it means to do hard things. And it's a message It doesn't just, uh, it's not just about for teenagers. It, it works for us as adults as well. It says, uh, he says this in the book. He says, God is glorified when we are doing, or we are willing to do hard things. The Christian calling is hard, but it is also the only calling worthy of such effort. Think about all the effort I have to put in at work. It's nothing. Nothing compared to the calling that we've been called to as Christians. And I hang on to that. And that's what gets me from day to day to day. Christ never promises it will be easy. We will have to do hard things. final day here when we leave this temporary home and we go home and we hear well done, good and faithful servant. Lord help us to control our hearts and our minds with the help of your Holy Spirit. Father help us today and every day to live lives of compassion, kindness humility gentleness and patience help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. Heavenly Father we pray for eyes to see we pray for wisdom to understand. We pray that the words we speak will be yours. We pray that your peace will rule in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons you teach. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, We prepare this time of communion this morning. It's a time for us to gather together in Christ. It's a time for us to look into our hearts, to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. So what I'd like you to think about today is Christ went to the cross and he gave his life for us so that we could live our lives for him. And that's what that call to worship is about, is that through Christ's death on the cross, we are able to live for him and to be able to have salvation through him. Not to earn salvation, because there's nothing we can do to earn it. It was a gift freely given by the grace 
of God in Jesus Christ. So as we come into our time, as we are gathered together here, we are gathered together as the disciples were for that last meal. When Christ was given up, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it and after he, he filled it, he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And this is what we are called to do. We are called to come together in communion to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross so that we could live for him and live eternally through him. The body of Christ broken. the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be back. So, as you can tell, I've had surgery and everything's going well, so I'm here to pray for everyone this morning. Is there anyone that would like prayer this morning? Is there anybody in particular? I've got most everybody on the list, but <laughs> if there's any more. All right. Well, Father God, we come to you today to honor and praise your holy name. For it says in Philippians 4, 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all un understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let us unite together to pray for the healing for the following people. Doug, Denny, Joe, Mark, Amanda, Kelly, Carla, and Nick, and Joe, your grandson also. Father God, you know each one of these people. You know their needs. You are the great physician. Let the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit rain down upon them. Heal their bodies by the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who gives life and breath to all of us. We thank you, Jesus, and praise you for the blessings we all receive from you daily. Father God, I pray for all our children and grandchildren. Lord, lead them in the ways of righteousness. Set them firmly on the road that leads to you. Weed out the friends that will lead them astray and into dark places. Help them discern what is right and what is wrong. Give them the courage to do what is right always. Help them to stand and follow you through the storms in their lives. Let your light shine among them always. And Father God, keep our homeless safe at all times. Put a hedge of protection around them Give them food and shelter for each new day. Provide jobs and help them out. Help them to get out of their homeless situation, Father God. Be with them and comfort them and keep them. Father God, we lift up Preston to you for you to do a mighty work in his life. I pray he finds you through the trials he is facing, that he may glorify your name as he walks through the trials. And Father God, I pray Psalms 83 over the people in Israel today as yesterday they were attacked by the evil forces of this world. Psalms 83, one through four. O God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet, O God, be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. Verses 13 through 18. Make them like tumbleweed, O oh my God, like chaff before the wind, as fire consumes a forest or a flame sets the mountains ablaze. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Cover their faces with shame so that men will seek your name, O oh Lord. May they ever be ashamed and dismayed. May they perish in disgust, in disgrace. Let them know that you, your name is the Lord, 
that you alone are the most high God over all the earth. Let your name be praised. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to leave this place and to end this portion of our service, I pray this priestly blessing that the Lord gave to Moses for Aaron and his sons. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace.